Good morning. Well, on this cold morning, you're very brave to come out. <laughs> and it's a joy to see you all um, and to be together and to welcome you into a warm sanctuary for worship together. So special greetings to those of you who are here for the first time or who are visiting. We're always glad to see new faces um, or faces that are, are only with us occasionally. It's always good uh, to see familiar and to see new faces. I've got just a couple of announcements to share with you. Uh, I will remind you that at 2 o'clock this afternoon, Friends of Music uh, is having an organ concert. And so Hector Oliveira, who is the, one of the organists uh, who designed the organ uh, that we have, is coming. Um, he's here. He's in town. He practiced all day yesterday. So that concert's at 2 o'clock today. Um, and uh, I'm sure that you could still get a ticket at the door. Um, Shirley's nodding. So yes. Um, so I hope that you're able to do that. And then it's January. It's a good excuse to have lots of music in a cold month. So next Sunday in worship, we will have music, uh, special music in worship. So our traditional worship will be um, uh, put aside and we will have worship entirely of music. So uh, in honor of Martin Luther King Day, we'll celebrate our diversity through music and celebrate the ways that the three faiths that are the seeds of Abraham, right? So Christianity, Judaism, and Islam um, will, there's a little blurb in your bulletin about that. And so we have some special musicians coming from uh, the Chicago area to offer us a performance of their concert, There Always Something Sings. Uh, so I think it will be a wonderful time. We'll have some conversation with the musicians following worship. Uh, this is a little bit of arts on the edge um, in a new way. So, so that will be next Sunday. And I've invited guests from all over town to join us. So I hope it will be a wonderful Sunday. Do we have other announcements to share for the good of the community? All right. Then let us be together in a spirit of worship as we begin with our prelude.
Will you join me in the call to worship? Now thus says the Lord, the one who created you. Do not be afraid. God has called you by name, and you belong to God. When we pass through danger, danger, God, God is, with is with us. us. The waters will not overwhelm us. The fire will not consume us. For, For God, God is the creator, creator, the Holy one. one. We are precious in God's sight. God, God loves each of us dearly. Come, worship, worship God, God, who leads us into life. The opening hymn is number 168 in the Black Hymnal. We're a little thin on the ground this morning, so sing out. Now in unison, most, most wonderful, wonderful God, God, foolish and flawed though we are, we, we too delight in your beloved Son. As in his in name we gather in the house of many praises, may the heavens be opened for us, that we may catch a glimpse of that light and love that transforms our common days with a beauty not of our making. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray as we pray the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks, Fred. All right. Where are my chancel steps, friends? comes Calvin. Calvin, I think you grew six inches last week. You're so much taller. Good morning. Good morning. 
I'm glad that we have like some sparkles and bright colors. We could spark. I love your skirt. Oh, it has stars on it. It's perfect. Because it's still epiphany, right? <laughs> so today you're going to learn about the baptism of Jesus. So <clears throat> in between last week's story and this week's story, Jesus aged 30 years. Right? Last week he was a baby. We told the story of the wise people coming to the manger, right? And he had just been born. And this week, when you go to church school, you're going to hear about how Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan. He was about 30 years old when that happened. So in a week, he aged 30 years. Yep. But he's what? What does baptize mean, right? So you're going to learn about Jesus getting baptized today. So um, Jesus' cousin John is in the River Jordan, and Jesus comes to John and says, um, you know, will you baptize me? So we now baptize in the name of Jesus, but John couldn't baptize in the name of Jesus. He couldn't baptize Jesus in his own name. That would have been kind of weird, right? So he baptizes Jesus, and the story goes that the Spirit of God came in a dove, in a bird, and came down upon the water, and a voice came down that said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. So we understand, right, um, Jesus' baptism as the beginning of his work um, on behalf of God, as beginning to do God's work in the world. So we could talk all day long about what Jesus might have been like when he was 6 or 10 or 12 or 13 or all of those ages in between, but the scriptures don't tell us, so we kind of have to imagine so what we get today is Jesus as an adult beginning his work. And John spends a lot of time thinking about what Jesus as the Savior, as the Messiah, should do in the world. So I wondered if you had any tasks, chores, jobs, dreams, that if Jesus were coming today, you would want to be his job description. Do you know what a job description is? I didn't think so. So a job description is like, well, let's see. Who has an easier job description than mine to try to help you understand what a job description is? Yeah, maybe Mr. Campbell's. Do you know what Mr. Campbell's job description probably says? Play the piano. Direct the choir. Direct the children's choir. Help to choose music for each Sunday. So what would Jesus' job description be if he came today? I can't hear you, Lauren. Exactly what? Play the piano. Direct the choir. Okay, all right. Yeah, ten. Ten. Be kind to other people. I like that. The golden rule. Help people if they need help. What? Clean the litter box. Awesome. Yeah, giving me Windows 10. What else? What would be Jesus' job description? The golden rule. So what's the golden rule, 10? Treat other people how you want to be treated. Okay? Guess what John says is Jesus' job description? I'll give you a hint. John gets it wrong. What John tells Jesus or thinks Jesus' job description will be is not actually what Jesus does. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. <laughs> John wants Jesus to be a really strict judge. <laughs> and instead, Jesus comes and loves all kinds of people and is really generous um, and is always doing more than they think that Jesus should be doing. But Jesus doesn't look like the strict uh, person that John thinks he's going to be. John kind of wants him to come and be a police officer. And Jesus kind of shows up and looks more like your piano teacher. 
<laughs> so, so anyway, so you're going to learn more about Jesus' baptism today. But I was just thinking, what, would, what if we, um, knowing what we know, if we could put together a job description for Jesus that would be a little bit closer to what we know about who Jesus is and was. So let's have a prayer, and then you can head off to church school. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you come into the world to teach us and to love us and to teach us how to love one another. So for all of the ways that you said yes to God, help us say yes to you to do the things that you have taught us. In your name, we pray this day and always. Amen. So we're going to hear from uh, the Gospel of Matthew this morning. We're in chapter 3, and we'll hear verses uh, 1 to, actually, 17, not 19. That's my fault. Um, 1 to 17. So you'll hear the baptism of Jesus. You'll hear the lead-up of John the Baptist um, proclaiming that Jesus is coming, and then you'll hear the actual exchange uh, with John and Jesus, and then you'll see and hear of Jesus being baptized. So as we jump these three decades in the short turn of a page, um, we have to imagine a lot. So I'll just remind you that John the Baptist, of course, uh, was Jesus's cousin. Um, So remember the two moms from uh, whom they come, from Elizabeth and Mary. So we get this. Uh, Not only do we miss all of Jesus's childhood, but we also miss John's childhood. Uh, So as we pick up this story, we have these two cousins Um, And I came across this quote by scholar Alice White, who says, John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins in the same way that judgment and grace are cousins. So just sort of leave that for you to think about as I read you these verses from the Gospel of Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And this is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan River. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when John saw that many Pharisees and Sadducees were coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath of the one to come? Bear fruit that is worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire, and his winnowing fork in his hand, he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, But the shape he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And so John the Baptist consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove and to light on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Here ends our reading. May God indeed add blessing to the reading of these words. Would you join me in the spirit of prayer? Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks 
for beautiful images in scripture that help us to imagine and to visualize who you are and whose we are, how important it is for us to be named, how beautiful it is when you speak to us of your love and assurance and your call for us all. May the meditations of my heart and the words of my lips be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, my Savior and Redeemer. Amen. As we stand in this early season of Epiphany, this season when we think about the ways uh, that we come to believe, that we come to understand, that we come to think, um, and the ways and the moments that happen for us, sometimes immediately and sometimes slowly over many years as we become aware of the light. We get this reading from Matthew that is John the Baptist issuing a divine invitation, inviting people to come to him to be baptized, to make way the path to prepare for the Messiah. John the Baptist, who invites not just those of his time, but invites us on this morning to um, welcome and to be aware of the presence of the Holy in our midst. He signals to his listeners uh, with this language about the kingdom of God. Whether you have heard this passage many times or this is your first hearing, you should know that as John the Baptist talks about the kingdom of God, listeners in his own time and context would have perked up to understand that John the Baptist was signaling that he believed the time had come, the time they had waited for, for the Messiah to arrive. We hear him quote Isaiah in that passage, Isaiah 40, that prepare the way of the Lord. And we see the baptism, just as we do in the Gospel of Mark, that begins Jesus' ministry. Jesus' consent to take up the work of the world, to take up the work of God, to say yes to the call that is before him. John calls for repentance, as do other prophets, to turn from sin, to turn from sin and folly, to get ready and to make way. That's all part of that preparation that happens. And John the Baptist describes and predicts Jesus to be this judgmental and harsh person. To, um, he, as opposed to the gentle leader that Jesus is, as I was talking with our uh, youth about, he predicts that Jesus will be, of course, that very uh, typical, the setup for what the Messiah will be that we get all the way through the Hebrew scriptures, uh, that the Messiah will be, um, will use a winnowing fork, will separate the wheat from the chafe, will, um, will bring punishment and harsh order with him. There's this jarring opposition between the Jesus that John is talking about and the Jesus that was. In fact, you see John the Baptist later in um, the Gospel of uh, Matthew. In chapter 11, we see John the Baptist call out from his jail cell, Are you really the one? So all these chapters later, we hear John the Baptist saying, was, was I wrong? Are you really the one? Because his expectations don't match who Jesus is or his style. It's had me thinking about the power of anticipation. The anticipating of something is half the fun or twice the stress, depending on what it is you're anticipating, right? No matter our planning, we're not always ready for what unfolds when something big happens that will mark a new beginning or a new opportunity or a new challenge. When it's something exciting and good, our planning and our learning, preparing, sets the stage for how we experience it, stretches out the anticipatory joy of it, and minimizes perhaps the anxious parts with our well-preparedness. The pre-story is important. And when it's something that is not as happy or joyful, then our anticipating is often the bigger stress of it. The wondering, the what ifs, the what if this goes wrong, the how might this uh, dissolve, the what if we don't get there, what if we don't um, have enough preparedness. Anticipating something is half the fun and twice the stress. So John's anticipating this moment, uh, a, our, as a people of faith anticipating the coming of a Messiah, is the same. The anticipation is half the fun or twice the stress. Repentance, John's invitation to repent, to express remorse for wrongdoing, 
comes in this light of the arrival that the kingdom of God, the benevolent kingdom of God, has come. It's not a cost or a tax uh, of God's coming. John does not present us to say, if we don't do this, then Jesus will not come, then the Messiah will not arrive. John presents this idea of contemplation and remorse as something that we do as joyful uh, thanksgiving or in joyful recognition that the kingdom has come, that the benevolent kingdom has arrived. It almost suggests to us that such an action or contemplation is a celebration of the arrival of goodness and love. Repentance is not a word we hear all that often anymore. I looked up uh, repentance and how it's been used in language and in use, and it kind of peaked around the 1800s, which got me thinking about all the things that were happening in the 1800s that might cause a people to talk about repentance. Perhaps will not surprise you that over the course of history that the lowest moment in time when the word repent or repentance was used was in the 1950s. And my friends, it's making a comeback. It's on the steady rise from 2010 and onward. The use repent, uh, the word repentance or repentance is coming back into fashion. Perhaps you heard at the end of last year that Miriam Webster proclaimed that the word of 2018 was justice. Interesting, this word justice with so many different uses and contexts. Merriam-Webster reports that the word justice was looked up 74% more in 2018 than in 2017. The concept of justice was at the center of so much of our national debate in the past year. Racial justice, social justice, criminal justice, economic justice. In any conversation about these topics, Merriam-Webster uh, wrote the question of just what exactly we mean when we use the term justice is relevant and part of the discussion. The year's news had so many stories involving the division within the executive branch of government responsible for the enforcement of laws, the Department of Justice, sometimes referred to simply as justice. Of course, the Mueller investigation itself is constantly in the news, being carried out through the Justice Department. And this other big news story that included yet a different meaning of the word justice, a synonym or title for judge used frequently during the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings in the Supreme Court. Justice has these varied meanings that do a lot of work in the language. Meanings that range from the technical and legal to the lofty and philosophical. So for so many reasons and for many meanings, one thing's for sure, Justice has been on the minds of many people in 2018. Well, that doesn't even talk about biblical justice, or God's justice, or justice uh, as our own personal justice. It's had me thinking, since I heard this, how many different ways justice can be used. Which, of course, led me to my next thought. So what might the word for 2019 be? Far too early to know that. But one of the questions is, what might your personal word for 2019 be? We gave out star gifts last year. And if you didn't get one, it's not too late. There's still a basket on the counter. You could grab a star on your way out. It's a tradition that we have come to do here in Epiphany, to reach in and kind of blindly grab a star, or to, uh, for the youth that has brought the basket around to decide which star is yours. It's kind of a nice spin that has happened organically all on its own. But the idea is not, as perhaps in the early days, uh, some of us used to like flip through the basket and say, oh, no, I don't want that one. I want this one. Um, or that one's too hard. I'm going to put that one back. Could that be your personal word of the year to ponder over these coming months? What might this word mean to you? What lens might it provide for how you view the world through it, how you encounter others? what you bring forth into the world, what might it anticipate? If we remember the arrival again of the benevolent kingdom of God today, then what do we do in response to such arrival, to the arrival of goodness and love? Maybe your star gift is what the divine invites from you this year. So I invite you to visualize your word over these coming months, to tell others about it, to contemplate it in prayer and in quiet time and in meditation, to keep it handy, 
to let it speak to you and challenge and to comfort you. Maybe it marks what you need more of in your life, or maybe it marks what life needs more from you of. The season of Epiphany is a season of divine invitation, an opportunity for the Spirit of God to come again, for the heavens to break open again in small and in big ways, to strike us. Now, sure, we had to get ready to see whatever is just ahead or already in front of us. And sure, we're going to have to take up the daily part of life again after the heavens close up again. So did Jesus. So did Jesus contemplate and get ready and consider and have a willing answer when he came to the banks of the River Jordan. In fact, he probably didn't anticipate that John would resist. No, I don't want to baptize you. I want you to baptize me. Jesus, before taking up the work of God, had only some small idea what was ahead for him, just as we have only some small idea of what the work ahead for us is this year. So let me leave you with poet Michael Coffey's poem, Openings and Obfuscations. A break in the clouds cracked the God barrier open. The heavens sang and summoned him as benevolence. But then, as always happens and must happen, the closing, the occlusion of the space between the synapse spreads and the search for chemical signals to fill the gap with electric pulses higher than lightning. Whether Jesus' baptism or your own plunging initiation, maybe a mystical desert epiphany of dazzling diamond light, a Himalayan climb into oxygen-starved euphoric heights, or a canyon ramble descending into depth and profundity. Whether pharmaceutical prescriptions for bliss and dreamland or wild fungus visions of you outside yourself in glory, you will always come back to this mundane moment like Jesus, walking on from the Jordan to the middling towns you trod again, the profane path of normalcy, a breakfast egg, kissing, money spent, the ICU waiting room, a neat whiskey, forest walks, a desk and its chair, so thick with obfuscation you feel lost in these days. But even these wanting words can't completely hide the wonder. May it be so. Amen. Our hymn of prayer is number 169 in your black hymnal, What Ruler Wades Through Murky Streams.
a little worried if you were going to pick up that hymn or not. It's a new one that we've never done before. A plus. Kathy says, two thumbs up. Kathy actually wrote to Tom Choker, who's a friend of hers, and was like, you got any advice? <laughs> so um, good work, good work. It's such, it's such a pretty song, and it so fits with the theme. We couldn't not choose it. So thanks for uh, trying something new. All right, um, we take a time to share prayer concerns with one another as we gather in worship this morning. Always the things that I bring are so uh, long and, and manifold. Let's start with you all. What are the things uh, that you bring uh, for prayers this morning to share? Julie. Awesome. I'm waiting for pictures, Julie. Uh, okay, awesome. Um, so Julie uh, brings the joy that uh, Tyler was married to Rachel last Saturday, January 5th. And so she, the joy of a happy son and a new daughter um, and, and just a beautiful wedding. So that is a great joy to start this, this morning with. Meg. Thanksgiving for everybody who volunteers around here in many, many, many different ways. Absolutely. What else do I have to share with you? Um, I received word that Art Glidden died this week. Um, Art died very peacefully at Mountain View on Wednesday. Uh, I have not heard any uh, word from the family that they'll have a service, so we'll see um, what they decide. Um, Art was well into his 90s, as many of you uh, know, and so I bring you that. I also got a message from Patty McHewitt uh, that her mom has studied into a routine and Patty Max said if things hold over the next couple days, she'll, she'll be home uh, later this week, and then if she needs to go back out, she will. And so um, our, our prayers for her mom and for Patty Max to have safe travels back from Oklahoma. Anything else? Katie? He did, yep. Okay. So prayers for, um, for the Rourke family, uh, Buzz. Buzz passed away this weekend. Katie, when did he, when did we lose him? Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and are your folks still out there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay, good. Okay. All right. So Beth and Greg are down with them and they had a little gathering yesterday and they'll look to something else in the summer. Thanks, Katie. All right. Uh, let us have some time of silent prayer. Gracious and holy God, we draw near to you in prayer. As we consider big invitation for the holy to come again, for the heavens to open, and for you to come down and touch us, to comfort and console us, to challenge and to spur us, to tickle our senses, and to bring us aware again of the beauty that is all around us. We remember in the midst of big things like justice and repentance, we remember too the people in our lives that need our immediate care and love. For those we have lost this week, for new beginnings that have also come this week, for the deep and complicated ways of joy that comes in the goodbying and the greeting. And for all of the murky places where we stand still, in government shutdowns, in inability to hear a difference of opinion or to find compromise, in a muddy murkiness where we cannot even understand the hearts and the wishes of our neighbors. Open again your heavens this morning and come down and touch us. Remove the obstacles and make way the path for the coming of love and goodness and the benevolent kingdom of God again this year. We pray in the name always of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Oh, 
Always being invited by the divine, by God, to share of the best of ourselves with one another, with each other, to come together to bring more of the Christ's light into the world. And so, again, I invite you, may our offering this morning be received. Join me in our prayer of dedication. Accept these gifts, we humbly pray, O God. Let them give you honor and glory as we serve the needs of your people. And let the called and redeemed of God say, Amen. Our closing hymn is God of Change and Glory, and it's number 177 in your New Century hymnal, your black hymnal.
As you go out into this week, whatever it will ask from you, may the heavens open and may you know that the presence of God dwells in and around you in all that you do, calling you forth from this day into the next, always in divine invitation to do the work of Jesus the Christ. Amen.